WSJE Radio, St. John's University, Sports and Hip Hop with DJ Mad Max. We have a very special guest here, a horror icon, Michael Berryman. Michael, how are you doing today? Doing well today. And yourself? Doing pretty well. How have you been maintaining during COVID-19? Uh, so, uh, following the uh, protocol and staying safe and staying away from people that don't wear a mask, basically. Have you done any virtual conventions at all? Because I know there are, I've heard that there are some people doing virtual conventions. No, I have not done that. I, I do have a show coming up uh, in uh, San Antonio, Texas. It's going to be supposedly a COVID protocol. So um, we'll see how that goes. Yeah. But um, that is, what is that? It is. Oh, it's at the end of the month. How about that? Oh, okay. <laughs> it's before Halloween. Yes, it is. I'll, I'll be posting on my Facebook page, Michael Berryman. Uh, I'll have a, a website, uh, michaelberryman.com. Uh, we've got some, uh, you can get, order pictures from there. And, and a, we have a couple of really cool um, uh, uh, clothing items and hats, stuff like that. So that's kind of where things are at until they get better. Yeah, unfortunately, I hope I hope this clears up soon. I know the vaccine, I know the Trump is trying to push it f before the election. I don't see that happening. I think it's going to take some time. It's going to take real science and uh, yeah. Um, yeah, we're not even going to go there. <laughs> <laughs> so how about we start from the beginning? Uh, tell me what it was like growing up in Los Angeles. Well, um, the west side of Los Angeles is a city called Santa Monica. That's where I grew up. It's uh, it was like you know 20 blocks from the from the beach. Spent a lot of time um, at the beach. I enjoyed surfing and uh, scuba diving stuff like that. Uh, growing up as a kid on the on the west side, uh, it was uh, the va uh, there's the San Fernando Valley, which was mostly farms. That's where my mom grew up. She was a nurse. My dad was from Pasadena. He was a doc uh, doctor. Um, um, well, I'm actually uh, writing my autobiography, so I, I covered oh, wow. everything from being born to pretty much uh, um, what happened after Hills Have Eyes and Cuckoo's Nest. Uh, I don't know how much of my uh, uh, biography you have read. Uh, what do you know of my early years? I know a lot about the Hills of Eyes. I know you were in One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. Weird right. science. Right. Okay, so pretty much uh, my history from your perspective is pretty much based on uh, my film work. Is, is that about right? Yeah. Okay. Um, well, uh, how can I recap? Um, well, number one, the obvious is uh, uh, how I look. I look different than most people. Uh, there's uh, actually creases in the side of my skull where I had a craniectomy. That's where uh, I was in children's hospital about th this time you would be in first grade. My father was a brain surgeon and neurologist, so he got me to a good, good hospital. Uh, he had been, uh, he was a, a Navy surgeon in uh, World War II in the Pacific. He wound up going on a secret mission at Hiroshima after they dropped the bomb. And he, you know, like, was taking a look at the various victims and, you know, kind of doing, it was like a big lab experiment, you know. He, you know, nuked, uh, you know, a lot of civilians. Um, anyway, it was uh, hellacious, horrible, and uh, I've always been uh, pro-humanity, and uh, uh, I've been anti-nuke my entire life. I've, I've known uh, physicists and a lot of scientists and people that uh, um, see the world as a better potential than w what we've done so far as humans. I, um, some kinds, uh, well, the humans don't make very good choices a lot of times, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so uh, that being said, uh, when he came back from, from this uh, mission in Hiroshima, uh, he, of course, was radiated, obviously. Yeah. I've, got, I've got photographs of uh, vaporized uh, shadows of human beings that were vaporized in, into the uh, cement walls. You know, so uh, we never should have split the atom, in my opinion, and it, it served us no purpose whatsoever. People say that stop the war, save lives, and uh, 
you know, then there's you know, Chernobyl, nukes, et cetera. And you know, we're no safer than we've ever been. Yeah. You know. um, so I grew up through the uh, seeing the world through the prism of a, uh, a survivor of a nuclear war, basically. Um, my skull was fused, my brain was growing, I would have died. So the only way to save my life was to basically uh, cut my skull into pieces and put in bones, uh, chips of bones from my uh, hip, use them as spacers and hope that um, when it all knitted back together, it would continue growing. Otherwise it would have uh, um, um, suffocated my brain, I would have died, you know, would have gone blind first. So I'm very grateful to the physicians that saved my life. Yeah. Uh, being born premature, of course, caused a lot of other issues. The ends of my fingers and toes are never fully formed. I can't sweat. I have no sweat glands at work. Uh, all my teeth were uh, underdeveloped, had to be ripped out. I've had uh, a lot of medical issues uh, throughout my life, mostly uh, heat stroke and a few other things of that nature. Uh, so that being said, uh, you know, you, you grow up as a kid and you have aspirations. You want to you, you want to do things in your in your life and. Um, I made it through high school. I had good grades. Uh, went to college, uh, University of California in San Luis Obispo, a really beautiful part of the state. And uh, ran out of money. You know, didn't have. Uh, I, I didn't have a scholarship. I didn't have funding from my parents. Uh, so it's, uh, I was pretty much on my own. Uh, I started working at age 14 as a bus boy and carried as many different types of jobs as I could until my ether got too hot. I've been a butcher. I've been a Oh gosh, I've done private security, I've done uh, bail enforcement, uh, a whole bunch of stuff. Um, long story short, I left in 1972. I left uh, my college town, uh, uh, you know, had a minor in art history, had some study veterinary science, but because my, my fingers were compromised, I couldn't do procedures and surgeries on animals. I learned a lot. Mm -hmm. Actually, when I was a Boy Scout, actually, I was an Eagle Scout, yay. Actually had a first aid to animals merit badge, which is uh, pretty cool and groovy. Um, so I came back to Santa Monica and wasn't sure what I was going to do. Uh, opened up a little gift shop with a friend of mine. Uh, yeah. yeah. So in 1972, you, you had the, uh, the 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 ending of the arc of the uh, peace love uh, uh, hippie movement. Uh, in the mid to late 60s, it was wonderful. The California dream was really something really. To be uh, respected, uh, people got along. You could you could hitchhike on the coast highway or anywhere in the country, and pretty much get picked up by any kind of a hippie band. You'd be safe, <laughs> killed or murdered. You know, it, it was it was really a lot of, a lot more freedom back then. You could actually sleep at the beach and and, and be safe. Um, people looked after one another. People cared about humanity. They cared about each other. So these are the basic principles that I grew up with. Even though I was raised Catholic and was an altar boy, enough said. Uh, I did have a chance to work in Italy, went to the Vatican, um, had a conversation uh, with, the, with uh, the Vatican guards while I was following a bunch of tourists, and uh, I know their dirty little secrets, and they're, they're not secret anymore. So <laughs> I asked a few poignant questions, like, you know, I understand there's a, a pile of baby bones uh, from when, uh, you know, it was an illegitimate child, for instance. And of course, they, they deny that history. We, I, you know, we know it's factual, it's true. Same thing with the LA Archdiocese. Uh, I had to go to Catholic school. It was, uh, um, uh, it was uh, good and bad, and the bad's obvious. Um, when I went to the Roman Colosseum, uh, you know, there's all these tourists. It's weird how tourism and, and people go places because they think you know, certain parts of history are fascinating. Ooh, ah, ooh, yeah. the Colosseum. Uh, what, what a heinous, horrible situation. They, you know, they went out, you know, they took people on ships and they went and they brought back lions and tigers and bears and, and exotic animals and released them all and had them all kill one another. And people are just going, yeah, great, you know, let's party. Let, let, let's go eat and go to the vomitorium and throw up and eat, eat some more. I mean, you know, yeah, they built roads and they did some, you know, some smart things, but, you know, the quality of life it depends upon how you treat one another and, and what, what you hold as values. Uh, ethics is one of my favorite words. You know, some people don't know what it means or don't care. I think it's kind of important. Um, well, I actually was a, um, um, 
Well, I got real close to a, a guy by the name of Bob Dylan, actually, who was one of his guards at his home for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. Didn't pay very well, but he was an interesting fellow. I had some wonderful conversations with him. Great poet, wrote some really important lyrics. The anti-war movement, the uh, folk movement, along with rock, you know, the Beach Boys, Crosby, Stills, and Nash. I mean, uh, uh, the blue, uh, so, some of the wonderful blues uh, players. Uh, uh, all of the, everything artistic and humanity rising became very important to me. So all of that brings you up to kind of where I got involved in film. And what happened was um, I wanted a homestead in Alaska. Uh, I used to be a woodsman, climb trees, chainsaw, make a lot, build log homes, all that kind of stuff. I can do it in a cold environment where I wouldn't have heat issues. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of my plan. So I'm in Venice Beach in 1972, and a gentleman wa walks up to me. Uh, I was at a store across the street, an antique store, it's very famous, called the Gallimaufry. You know, and uh, the people that shop there are, you know, very wealthy. And, and I know a lot of wonderful, wealthy people that were wonderful people. Yeah. Uh, there's people that are not wealthy that can do horrible things, and people that are wealthy that, that can do good or bad. It's your choices. Uh, Red Skelton, uh, the family, uh, we were good friends with them. They used to go to the house and read comic books with uh, Richard, his son. Um, so all in all, um, uh, I was just uh, making ends meet. You know, I learned a lot, but still didn't have a career. Didn't know, uh, you know, and at about that time, uh, uh, corporate uh, working for a company or corporation was becoming the thing. And um, uh, I still have a flip phone. I like to be able to, to talk to someone in customer service instead of doing everything online, et cetera. You know, it's, it's, it's kind of cool and groovy. Um, so while we, uh, we sold house plants and uh, the local artists in Venice Beach who would hang their wares up in our, it was a little old house, like about a one bedroom house, beach house built in 1930s. And we rented it out as a little, just a little arty store. Well, because we had uh, palms and other kind of, you know, uh, cool uh, uh, plants, um, the people across the street said, hey, we're having an invitation sale. People are coming here. So if you could bring some of those in and we have all these exotic uh, Chinese egg urns, et cetera, antiquities, it would make it look more homey. So I said, yeah, sure, we'll do that. So we're hanging out, waiting for, uh, you know, everybody showing up in Bentleys and Rolls Royces and stuff. And they're, they're, they're very interesting people. And I get an introdu introduction to a gentleman by the name of George Powell. And his daughter was married to the other gentleman who, who they were co-owners of this antique store. So I put two and two together and we were having a conversation. I realized that I told him, I said, do you know who you are? You're George Powell. You made War of the Worlds, Journey to the Center of the Earth, Time Machine. Uh, you started out with the puppetoons when you were in Czechoslovakia. And he just tapped my hand. He said, it's all good. He says, uh, are you an actor? And I go, no. He says, well, uh, you, you have a face that's interesting. I'd like to put you in my movie, Doc Savage. And I had read the books. And I, so I, I told George, I said, uh, yeah, it sounds interesting, but I really want to go homestead in Alaska. I can still do that now. And he said, well, just here's my card. It was a Warner Brothers business card. So I called him and um, they called me back. And they had me come in for a fitting to uh, be the coroner for a uh, uh, Doc Savage, The Man of Bronze with Ron Ely. And we filmed at uh, Harold Lloyd's estate, which was very cool. Uh, actually, a friend of mine, Ant Anthony Caruso, uh, who was uh, uh, a Disney contract player, he had a mole on his cheek, very Italian. And in one of the Star Trek episodes, uh, uh, Black and White Days with uh, uh, Kirk, uh, they, they they go to a planet where they're getting broadcast from our old uh, gangster movies, so everybody's behaving in that manner. And Tony Caruso was the one that goes, ah, hey, Spock, I, I want some of those fancy heaters, you know, guns, etc. Well, that was uh, Anthony Caruso. Well, his son was uh, an extra. So when I showed up at Harold Lloyd's estate my first day as an actor, I was, I was nervous, uh, everything fits good, it was just going to be fun, work a day, make, make a seven... Uh, Four hundred dollars. <laughs> it was good money back then, and my friend, my friend Ray is going to uh, uh, drive this this uh, hearse, and the clutch is slipping, and, and I go, "Wow, it's it's Anthony, it's, it's Tony's son." So it, it was a friendly, happy day. We got through the day, and 
uh, George made sure that I had a two-day guarantee, which uh, according to labor history laws, it uh, is called the uh, Taft-Hartley Act. And that allows you to work two days in a union uh, company situation, but on day three, you have to join a union. So he paid my uh, startup uh, dues for Screen Actors Guild, and he got me my first role, I had a Screen Actors Guild card, a couple hundred bucks in my pocket after two days of work, and had no clue what I was going to do. And um, I, was, I, I got a four-wheel drive, a Dodge, old Dodge truck, and I was getting all my gear ready to uh, fill out the paperwork and drive up to Alaska. I got a phone call one day from the casting director for One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. It just so happened that that was the same casting directors that were casting for George Powell. So that's how we, long story short, but that's how we wound up uh, doing our, our second film, which was Cuckoo's Nest. Mm -hmm. What was Jack Nicholson like? Straight up, ornery, honest, happy, straightforward, hardworking, uh, as a zest for life, I love the guy. He's just a straight up honest, good guy all the way around and talented, very, very, very talented. He works hard, deserves everything he's got. From there, how were you connected with Wes Craven? Well, uh, they were doing uh, Hills Have Eyes. They, you know, he had done Last House on the Left with uh, um, uh, Peter Locke and I think uh, Barry Cohen. I think Barry was, was in, one of the co-producers on that. So after Cuckoo's Nest, and I'm sure that Wes had seen Cuckoo's Nest, and you know they're going to have the, the Hills family and their mutants. So, uh, you know, with the, the look of my uh, skull, for instance, and the ends of my fingers, you know, not being the fingertips, they figured, well, you know, that kind of fits the part. So I was basically. Uh, uh, a casting call went down to Culver City and uh, I met Peter Locke and Barry Kahn and Wes Grape and then we had a conversation and uh, we hit it off real well and Wes is very, very calm, intelligent, he used to be a professor. Uh, we just decided uh, it would be a good fit. So I said, well, yeah, well, we'll, we'll see you in uh, Victorville. And I used to I used to live out in that area, I was very familiar with the high desert. It's miserable in the sun, of course, but in the spring and fall, it's absolutely in the winter. It's, 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 when the desert's in bloom, it's, it's remarkable. You should check it out sometimes. So we, we got along really well. We worked really hard. Uh, didn't have a lot of amenities. Uh, my good friend, uh, 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 Susan Lanier, uh, we, had, we had a lot of fun. Uh, she plays Brenda. She's a marvelous singer, very, very talented lady. Uh, I'm still in touch with... Uh, um, uh, Janice Blythe, who played Ruby, um, uh, keep in touch with Peter Locke over all these years. You know, we, we lost Wes, went to his services a couple of years ago. Um, uh, we worked uh, four times together, you know, Hills 1 and 2. Uh, we did uh, um, Invitation to Hell with Susan Lucci. And uh, the other one, of course, was uh, Deadly Blessings. Mm -hmm. Did Wes Craven ever tell you why he named, especially your character, after the planets? No, not really. Uh, I mean, Mer Mercury, Pluto, and Mars. Uh, uh, Ruby wasn't, you know, it should have, could have been Venus, but uh, no, there's no, there was never an explanation, really. <laughs> <laughs> And I know before just saying that you didn't have any sweat glands and I read a little bit about they had to basically did not let you work long hours certain days because it was so hot out in the desert. I, uh, yeah, well, the ones I have, to, they don't work, you know, they're all plugged up. So in order to dissipate body heat, I'd have to stay in the air conditioning or take bags of ice, put them, you know, by your jugular, keep your blood cool, keep it so it cools the brain or under your armpits or your groin. Uh, stay hydrated, yeah, but uh, also take your electrolytes. But I, didn't, I don't sweat. Uh, the main thing is, is stay as cool as possible. So I would do, uh, we would block the shots to, if, for, for the exteriors in the daytime and uh, you, you get through the, uh, the footage and then you realize you have coverage and then you have to you know, re do a reversal. So 
it's not like you can uh, just film from one direction. You know, uh, you see more of that in, in indie films where you don't have a big budget or a lot of time. Uh, it, it was tough. In the evenings when it was cold, in the evenings, uh, those were no problem for me. But in the daytime, I hung in there the best I could. And uh, um, as a matter of fact, at the end, and I actually had uh, arm surgery underneath my arms. I had uh, abscesses. Uh, that was ongoing for decades, actually, because uh, premature birth causes certain situations. And in my situation, the sweat glands, hair follicles, and sebaceous glands were all malformed. So where there would be, uh, where hair would be growing or where there would be uh, you know, an oil gland or a sweat gland, uh, they, were, they weren't fully formed. So they would turn into an abscess and they're no fun, I'll tell you what. <clears throat> you know, they start really small and they'll be the size of your thumb in 24 hours and they have to be carved open. Uh, I, I, I even had to have a couple of them worked on both arms uh, on a few days off and then go back out to the desert and do uh, my running, jumping, and, you know, uh, chaos. As a matter of fact, uh, if you look, that's why we had the, uh, the hides covering my shoulders. It gave it a good look, but it also would hide the abdominal dressings, which I, I used to uh, uh, keep the wounds clean. Um, at the end, uh, when we wrapped, uh, actually had, we were all having dinner together, and uh, Peter Locke, the producer, explained to me that he said, uh, the guy who played uh, uh, Papa Jupiter, now he was within his rights, you understand? We were outside of the studio zone just enough to where the cost of production was, uh, was, was uh, a little less. But we're only we're supposed to work so many hours a day and then you, know, and then you, you have a, 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 break, a, a lunch break or a second meal if you go longer, things of that nature. And then you're, you're off the clock when you get back to the hotel. So there were, there were days where it, it just so happens so that, that you run a little late. Well, when you run a little late, it costs you more per hour per actor. And this was a union shoot. I, I love my union. I think unions are really a good thing. So every single time we were a, a half an hour late or 45 minutes or uh, whatever, uh, uh, Jimmy uh, Whitworth would, uh, would call the union and report, which was totally valid. And it became an irritant to the production because uh, you know we're shooting in Super 16, they're on a limited budget, and, and they were not happy with having to pay these, these bumps. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I didn't really have one, a say one way or the other on that. I just figured, well, well, well you, you agreed to this contract, so uh, and, and we're working really hard for you, so then you, you just pay. But they basically said because of him doing that, that. And I had been not complaining and dealing with uh, my medical issues and, and the surgeries and still, you know, doing my job, that they were going to make me their poster child. In other words, give me a million dollars worth of free advertising. I said, well, that's all fine, but can we turn that into a paycheck? And he goes, no, no. And I said, we're going to put you on the poster on the ad. And, and of course, that uh, paid dividends o o over many, many years. And, and it, uh, uh, my third job, uh, there I am on the, on the, on the cover, and, and, and the film did quite well, and, and that created a niche for me uh, uh, for employment, you know, in, in the horror genre. You know, I've been called the uncrowned king of horror, et cetera, which is kind of funny. I, I know everybody in, in the horror industry pretty much over the last 40 years, and they're all really good people. Uh, so again, it goes back to you do the best you can, and, and, and uh, sometimes you get a break, you know, and my biggest break, of course, I always, I always uh, do a, you know, a shout out to uh, George Powell, because uh, thank you, George, uh, uh, he maybe saved my life. What was your reaction, because the poster is so iconic, as well as the movie, when you saw it in the Evil Dead, there was a torn poster of the Hills of Eyes in the basement. I am so glad you mentioned that. That uh, that is very excellent uh, on, coming from you. It just tells me that you're a real fan. You know your homework, and, and that's thank you. That, that's a very wise question. Yes, that's an excellent observation, my friend. Because um, that's one of the questions when I do a panel, uh, or 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 if I'm at my table and signing. Sometimes I'll I'll ask that question to the people that are lined up waiting to meet me, and I'll say, you know, where I ask that question, what movie is the poster in yeah. and, 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 you know, if they get that right, they get a free picture. Now, 
uh, I thought that was totally, totally cool and groovy. Now, the reason, do you know, do you know why it was in, in, in Evil Dead? Sam Raimi and Wes Craven were always under like a hidden battle, basically, of po- putting movie posters in their movies. Yeah, and all that, and it's basically like a dig at them because they're saying all this. You they were trying to make it like this movie wasn't as scary as this one. (laughs) You're absolutely right. That's exactly correct. Uh, Yeah, well done. Uh, Yeah, that's a that's a great trivia uh, piece of trivia history. That's uh, that's, that's accurate, and and they're doing a shout out to one another. I just thought that was really really cool, and the jaw, and that's why we had a Jaws poster in a trailer. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, all that all that kind of stuff is uh, that you know are chapters and books about the genre that are, uh, cover that kind of stuff. It's just it's, it's just a real treat. I, I like to, uh, uh, I would love to do lunch with uh, Ted Turner and just thank him for uh, him saving uh, all of those wonderful films, uh, AMC, uh, TNT. I mean. Uh, it's I, I love what we do because it's it's one of it's 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 comes from a rich tradition of uh, all the way back to where you know you, you come back to the cave or the campground and you're you're sitting around the fire to keep the critters away and you're going well you won't believe what happened today uh, you know I brought home something to eat but uh, I almost got munched by this uh, lion or tiger or bear or whatever I mean so people tell stories and then. And then when they pass uh, pass information, I have a lot of Native American friends, uh, Navajo, Aho, to my good friends at the, in Tuba City. Uh, I was good friends with, very good friends with Will Sampson. I uh, miss you, my brother, a wonderful, wonderful guy. Um, my great grandparents were in North Dakota before statehood, and my great great grandfather was a doctor from Germany, a physician, spoke many languages. He was good friends with the Hudson Bay tribe. And then when, it, um, after statehood and, you know, the, the U.S. and the, the white man, uh, you know, this, between the railroads and the Winchester rifle and barbed wire wars and free land grabs, that was a, 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 a very evil thing that uh, happened in, in, in this continent. Very, very evil. Yeah. And then, uh, there is a great folk singer by the name of Buffy St. Marie. She, I believe she's a Choctaw Native American. And uh, she's incredible. Um, and a, a lot of her uh, uh, songs and stories are based on, on, on historical fact. Um, Bob Dylan, I, I know Bobby really well. Uh, uh, he, he, he would write songs about uh, similar uh, 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 humanity-related uh, uh, issues, because uh, to ignore uh, behavior and to not stand up and, and do the right thing is, is just wrong. It's weak. Uh, see, when I was a kid, I'd get teased, but uh, and uh, you know, back in the '50s and early '60s, you know, kids you obey, and it's pretty much all you hear. Uh, well, I'm sorry, but uh, I was never one to just turn the other cheek. I don't, I don't put up with that BS. I yeah, no. Uh, I had a good friend that had polio, and he he had braces on his legs, and and we're talking second grade, you know, third grade, and you know somebody would come along and trip him and laugh and think it was funny, and I, and I would just go off. I, I would just go off. My dad was a doctor, and uh, I knew anatomy when I was a little kid, so I knew where to where to hurt you. <laughs> <laughs> got in trouble a lot, you know, but I, I just don't put up with that. Um, some of those uh, uh, areas of awareness and, and personal uh, uh, pain, because it's not, it's painful to be uh, abused, um, uh, it, it opens up your heart and your, and your awareness. So what, what I uh, could I was given the, the, the uh, blessing and opportunity to take some of those experiences and share them with other groups. Uh, for instance, kids. Uh, I, I had a lot of good friends in law enforcement. Uh, uh, Richard uh, Rafter Grudis and Richard Kroom. Uh, he was a chief of police, Dade County, Florida. Uh, Richard was. He was the uh, chief of police when Jim Morrison got booked for indecent exposure. It, it was his hand. It was BS. He knew it was politically motivated. And I said, what was it like uh, booking Jim Morrison? He says, oh, he's the most intelligent guy I, I, I ever, you know, did paperwork on. And he goes, and his father was an admiral, you know. I mean, I mean, so 
my point is, uh, uh, what are you going to do to make the world a little better place today? You know, if you don't have something in mind, wait for an opportunity to come toward you, and and then decide to join in to whatever degree you can. Uh, if that's not happening today, then uh, they do like the Hippocratic oath, you know, do no, at least do no harm, you know. And, and, and one of the biggest things for harm is personal harm and in the sense of uh, uh, having the despair and not having hope. You know, don't buy into other people's negativity, you know. It's just like, you know, I, I, you know, I, I grew up in the 60s and 70s and uh, been there, done that and seen a lot of things. And, uh, you know, I wanna, so through these people, I got invited to do anti-bullying programs in schools or uh, drug awareness for fifth and sixth graders. They don't want to listen to any grown up. So here <laughs> I am with my two buddies from law enforcement. One was, worked, worked in the CIA. Anyway, so you're talking to these sixth graders and they go, oh, they're going to tell us drugs are bad. Yeah, right, sure. Well, you know, so I wanted to get their attention and so uh, what I would I would start off with, and I'd say, uh, well, I'm going to write some names down on the chalkboard. They're chemical compounds, so you could look, we could technically call them drugs. So let's do that. These are drugs, and they're good drugs. Now the parents are volunteering, and the teachers are going, well, I don't know about this. And I write down adrenaline, endorphin, serotonin. You know, <laughs> 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 these, are things, these are things that your body makes. You know. And, and no one's going to hurt you or harm you or threaten you because you didn't pay for it. The price, of course, is being healthy, exercising, getting a good night's sleep, uh, you know. <laughs> you know <laughs> and and, and, and the, the kids really responded to it. They really, really did. And uh, so from a situation that was negative, uh, uh, I don't take the credit for uh, 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 something that came across uh, as an opportunity, if you see an opportunity to go, well, how can I engage in this? And uh, how, can, how can I uh, uh, make a positive uh, um, effort? And, and so you do what you can. And we can do that through storytelling. We can do that through songs. Uh, we can do that through something as simple as helping somebody across the street, mm -hmm. you know? So uh, getting involved in, in, in acting, uh, help uh, help me have a uh, number one uh, career, uh, a chance to uh, you know, take care of myself and my family, which is a, b a blessing in itself. And uh, I'm 72 years old now, and I I, I can you know, still stay, don't smoke, I stay uh, I exercise, lift weights. Uh, we have a pool, so I try to swim a lot. But um, you know, staying positive. A lot of times people say, well, why do you like to play a bad guy? Well, I've played everything from like a Motley Crue comedy to, uh, you know, scary horror, horror movie or science fiction, which I love science fiction. Uh, but playing a bad guy, there are certain things I will not uh, depict, you know. Uh, if I'm going to be a bad guy and I, and I do something that's heinous, it can be implied, you know after the fact kind of stuff. Uh, uh, I've had, uh, I, had a, I had a film in Wisconsin where uh, they, they, I arrived, uh, they were filming nights, I got in late that evening and uh, there was a scene where I was supposed to uh, be very uh, impolite to this young girl and she's in front of me and the rest is, you can use your imagination. I said, there's no way in hell we're gonna do it this way. You know, we, we can do it after the fact and you see nothing and it's implied and then the camera can reveal her and she can act and she's already been devastated. Well, the producer and director are getting all that. Well, we want to do it this way. And I said, well, uh, I have a tape recorder. And when we had our conversation about the scene in the script, we all agreed and I told you I was re recording the conversation and I did and here's what you said. You're gonna do it the way that I want to do it now and now you're changing your mind. And by the way, I don't work tonight, this is my travel day. Oh. And the next morning they go, well, we, we're replacing you. We hired somebody else. They go, great. Okay. I just called my union. And they said, before I leave, I have to have a full check in hand for payment. You know, sometimes people cheat you. you know, yeah, they do. But if you know your good contracts make for good business relationships. So there's things to uh, be aware of in life and you, you learn as you go and you hope you don't you know, repeat certain uh, slips and pitfalls. But uh, um 
my Screen Actors Guild has been good to me. Uh, George gave me a good, really good break. Um, I've had a chance to meet tens of thousands of, of people all over the world at conventions and shows. Um, I've got a stack of fan mail that's like, you know, 50, 50 deep. I have a website, michaelberryman.com. Check it out. We got some good stuff going on there. I have a Facebook page. It's, you can tell it's me. And yes, I maintain both those sites myself. Uh, I, if, if you find my address, just please appreciate it, but go to the website instead because I, I can't just keep, uh, I mean, it's appreciated, but uh, I, uh, I get over, you know, get overwhelmed. I, I, I have answered all my fan mail myself over the decades. Uh, yeah. But, um, uh, what else is going on? I don't know what else is going on. What else you got? <laughs> Working with Wes Craven, what made him such a genius when it came to making movies, especially for horror movies? Good question. Well, he knows exactly what he wants for each shot. Yeah, he, he, he knows exactly uh, if he's going to pump up the fear factor, he knows how far he wants, wants it to be. If he wants to, uh, like in the Freddy Krueger movies, there's scenes where the camera's coming down a hallway or, or, or the focus is pulling in closer toward a situation. A lot of anticipation in, in his uh, scares. You know, it doesn't always just jump out in front of you. There's a lot of, he leads up to a, a lot of situations. Um, in Deadly Blessings, for instance, uh, it was a good switch where they think I'm the bad guy, but I'm not. Um, he, he, he does good character development, which is critical because if things are happening to various characters and you don't like them or you don't know enough about them to, to get a read on, read on them to where you're kind of anticipating how they're going to respond in a certain situation because you sort of know them. Uh, Wes is very good at establishing characters. Yeah, so so you, you kind of know their tendencies. Um, I would say those are the elements that, uh, uh, that made his, 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 uh, his film strong. Uh, it, it wasn't just uh, special effects driven. Mm. What was your favorite scene from the Hills of Ice? <laughs> uh, okay, well, my favorite scene is when uh, the father bumps into Grandpa Fred and, he, and he's trying to hang and says that whole thing about, well, oh, you always try to scare away people by trying to hang yourself. And he goes, he goes, uh, uh, you're trespassing. <laughs> I mean, uh, and, then, and then they have the conversation. My favorite part of the scene is when he goes, so uh, the father's describing <laughs> well, Grandpa Fred, uh, he's, he's describing how he came home one one day and uh, my little baby girl was burnt, the uh, house was burnt to a crisp and she was burnt to a cinder and uh, that, that uh, devil kid uh, wasn't even singed. I knew he did it so I took a tire iron and I split his face wide open and then, and then the father goes, well, how bad was it? Well, <laughs> wait a minute, he just told you that. So it makes me laugh. And I was telling Wes one time we were having dinner, and I said, you know, there's something about that scene. I thought maybe you should have changed. And he goes, no. He goes, what happened next? And I'm thinking, I go, oh. So he sets you up with some over the top. It's almost humorous. It's like, what? Well, of course, how bad was it? Well, how? And then the camera goes to the stuff that he was going to, uh, that uh, um, Ruby wanted to trade. You know, and he goes, "What's this stuff? Uh, oh, oh no, oh that's nothing." And then, boom, crash through the window, and they overcrank the camera, and, and it's just, well, so a great setup. That's my favorite scene. In your opinion, Hills of Eyes is it's huge in pop culture. I consider it a classic. It's considered a classic by a lot of people. In your mind, why do you think it's a classic? What makes it a classic? Well, I'd say it's it's honest in the previous tradition of uh, of, of horror films in, in the sense that uh, it has an atmospheric quality to it 
And what I mean by that is that uh, it's believable. It's believable. The, the Hills family are not, not so over the top. I mean, Peter Locke, our producer, was Mercury, who gets, has the headset with Bonnet with the feathers. That was our producer, Peter Locke. Oh, wow. And, and maybe I'll make a joke like, let's turn and eat the toes. You know, yeah. uh, that was just delightful for us that my, our producer was playing that role. Um, the Hills family acted accordingly. Like when Ruby finally has to save the baby and, and she kills uh, Mars with the rattlesnake. And she, I mean, it tears her up. That's her brother, but you know, I mean, the whole nine yards. I thought the, 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 the father of the baby with the mustache, he, he was probably our biggest overactor, you know. Uh, um, but what makes it a classic is just it, it's so atmospheric and it draws you in and you're you're encapsulated into all of the um, emotional content you know uh, you, you're not going to go beyond the sh shell that he has created the space that you are sharing and that he is uh, creating I, I actually went with uh, Barry, uh, Barry Kahn, Peter Locke, and Wes Craven. They had me dress up like Pluto, and we went to a drive-in theater in Los Angeles in the San Fernando Valley. And during the trailer attack, they, they, we were young and dumb, and he, he said, why don't you go bang on some car windows? So uh, like an idiot, I did. And it was fine until I banged on this one car window, and this big guy about seven feet tall gets out with a baseball bat and he goes you scared my girlfriend i'm gonna smash your skull in. and i go oh wow and i used to be a long distance runner so i uh, i could stay ahead of this guy he was really ticked off and then i saw the van the headlights i'm yelling for because i'm trying to find where we park and the, the van is pulling out and everybody's glued to the their eyes are glued to the screen and the side door opens and it's west and he's holding on to the the seatbelt and he has his hand out and he goes, grab my hand. I jump in the van. The guy's still chasing and cursing. And we, we roll down the road. We get to Ventura Boulevard. We go to a diner and nobody says a word. We finally sit down and get our menus. And we're kind of scratching our heads, looking at one another and like going, you know, what just happened? And we all agree that uh, we have a hit. You know, we have a hit on our hands. Because you know, uh, he just had a way of telling the stories for, for real and uh, they're believable. I've, I've met families that, uh, and their kids, that's teenagers would even say at a convention, for instance, they'd say, yeah, um, we went out camping and we watched The Hills Have Eyes and my parents went to sleep and we, me and my sister stayed up all night because we were scared <laughs> and they were 16 years old. <laughs> it's kind of fun. What was it like making the trailer scene? Because that's, in my mind, that's the most iconic scene from it. It, it was, well, um, we had really tight quarters. It was not a lot of room. And uh, Susan, that's a, Susan Lanier and I had that wonderful scene when we did our blocking to where, you know, where's the camera's going to go here, then it's going to go here, then it's going to go here, and then we're going to zoom in. So you, you have to know the math for the lens, like, you know, where is the focal, where are you in focus? And you need to understand where you need to be, placing your body, your face, your look, get the right, have the light hit you. There's a lot going on, aside from just saying your lines and, and emotionally being involved in the part. So we were uh, blocking uh, all of this and getting it dialed in. And the footage that's in the final cut, there's a scene where um, Mars pulls me off of Brenda and uh, it, all you see is the back of my head. Well, when we did that scene, we, uh, my camera operator, uh, Eric Sarian, uh, he ran out of room and I literally had a gash in the back of my skull from the lens cap, metal lens cap, and he had a shiner. Um, um, but that was just the physical aspect of, uh, of moving in the scene and blocking. And then the emotional aspect was tremendously strong, especially when Morris real he eats, kills the bird, and then he realizes as a baby. And that whole slow, dramatic um, uh, approach to, you know, baby's fat, use fat, and, 
and, and then he and then the fight where they're just trying to defend them, uh, where, where uh, uh, D. Wallace uh, gets shot and then the mother gets shot and uh, it, and, and then that uh, um, the, the music uh, that, uh, from that strange electronic music that builds and builds and builds attention is just tremendous. Um, it was uh, it was uh, um, well. It was, it, it had a lot of impact, you know, uh, filming it. And we're all watching on the monitor, and those of us who were in the scene, you know, it, 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 it was just, it was tough, it was brutal, it was uh, in your face. I mean, you, you have to make a decision of, well, especially when Bobby is screaming, you know, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? You know, well, that's the pivoting point, you know, and the audience is drawn in at that point, you know, what would you do? You know, they're coming back, you know, killed mom, killed dad. And then he comes up with the idea of using mom for bait. What, what nobody would know uh, unless you were there. Um, uh, Virginia Vincent, when they had the squib, the, 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 the bullet explosion, when she fell back into the couch behind the little breakfast nook table, um, it repositioned where the squib load was. And when it went off, it, it literally uh, blew her nipple off of her, her breast. She had to go to the emergency room immediately. Wow. Yeah. It was a rough and tumble shoot. Sounds like it. How about the dog scene? How are they able to <laughs> control the dog in those scenes, especially because it's inter always interesting to me learning how dogs react in movies. Um, well, I wanted to be a veterinarian as, as a kid, so I, I always had dogs, and uh, I'd spent some time living at a, a wolf sanctuary for quite a few years. Um, uh, got trained and uh, actually worked with one of the walls with Tanya uh, Carloni, the, the owner of the uh, sanctuary Wolf Mountain. And there's certain things you learn, you don't look them in the eye. There, there's certain behaviors on how to work with dogs. Well, uh, the senior dog, the older dog, um, um, he was the bionic dog from the TV series. And the uh, Mo DeCesso, um, he had uh, working Hollywood uh, animals actually uh, bought a house to train all of the rats, Will and 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 Ben, that subsequent movie, um, because they have a king rat and they, and they follow him around. I mean, uh, so I learned a lot from them. So when I was working with the shepherd, what we do is um, the animal handler and the, and the actress spend all of their time together. You don't go off and do this and do that. You're a tight knit unit. So the animal becomes familiar with you. And then when he was um, uh, going for my neck, I had the collar on and we had a big piece of leather wrapped around a tennis ball that was attached where you couldn't see it. So when, and then they had a tube for the blood. So I was to grab him, you know, like this, and the dog was given a command to bite and hold and not release on the tennis ball. Uh, and it was out of off camera. And then when I was holding him and we're doing this, everything stays in the proper position. And so it looks very like he's just ripping the shit out of me, but uh, um, that's how you do it. You do it by the numbers, you do it exactly. I'm, I'm very safe around stunts. I, I don't play games. Um, I've worked around firearms and chainsaws and films. And I've, I've yelled cut before and said, no, this is not the way, this is unsafe. And let me show you as an example, this is better. Oh yeah, that's much better. Um, um, the dogs were delightful, uh, uh, a lot of fun to work with. Mm -hmm. How did you feel about the remake of The Hills of Eyes? Because personally, I'm a purist when it comes to horror movies, and I'm really not a fan of the remakes. I respect the classics. I feel like everyone should create their own ideas. How did you feel about the remake? Well, I'll be honest. Uh, I, the first 15 minutes or so, I thought were pretty strong, and then it became, oh, and once, you know, the gimmick with the uh, CGI um, expanding knife, uh, metal tooth saw thing, whatever that was, and it just got goofy. Uh, it turned into a video game for me. Um, uh, the opening was strong, um, you know, the atmosphere of the, the, you know, this nuclear town, and you, know, you see a little bit of somebody running here and there, and the curtains blowing in the breeze. So the atmosphere was set up real well. I, 
I just thought, uh, you know, in the prosthetics, they were kind of more modernized, so okay, but um, yeah, it just didn't, didn't float my boat. Not, not, a, not a big fan. I'm glad they did it. I mean, somebody got, got to work. I'm all, I'm all for people working, but yeah, I don't have it in my library. I'll just say, what is that? <laughs> <laughs> but I agree with you. Do something original, you know? Yeah. So it's a nice homage, but a shout out, but you know, write your own story. I, I agree. You've also worked with Rob Zombie and the Devil's Rejects. You played Cleavon, Devil's Rejects. What was it like working with Rob Zombie? Uh, Rob's, uh, Rob's a nice guy. He, he knows what he wants. And uh, um, uh, I, uh, I, had no, I had no issues with Rob at all. I just, uh, um, yeah, the, the scenes we did were, were, were fun. Uh, I liked this. Uh, I liked the scenes that had a little bit of creativity when we were doing the, uh, you know, just a little scene where Cleavon's vacuuming and, and uh, Princess Leia's line and what whatnot. But the chicken scene is real popular for obvious reasons. But the actor that was selling the chickens, uh, the, uh, he basically was going off script and uh, trying to basically uh, be in a scene hog and. And he just started getting uh, stupid, in my opinion, and left Ken Forey and I just standing there waiting to do our scripted lines. You know, I told him later, I told the kid, I said, hey, look, man, if, you know, if you're going to pull a stunt like that, you should let your other actors know straight up or you should discuss it with your director. You don't do that on the first take. And it's not very, and he didn't care. He, he was just happy to be on, on camera. And he, He's a stand-up hillbilly comedian. I wish him well, but I would never work with him again. <laughs> you know, so I had, he left me no choice, but to have Cleveland just get angry and, you know, you know, and then you know, what did Ken have to say? Just, you know, sh it's okay, shut up. Or, or, yeah. The scene could have been better, but, you know, Rob liked it. So what are you going to do? Yeah. What's your take on the horror genre today? I know we, we, you mentioned before CGI. That's a big thing that people don't like today in horror movies. But the 70s were, was a big era for horror movies. The Hills of Eyes, Texas Chainsaw, and Halloween. We, we had a lot of classes come out of the 70s. What's yeah. your take on the current state of horror movies? Well, uh, first of all, you need good character development. Yeah, and you need to know what you want, um, your arcs, what, what is it you're trying to say? Um, if it's just scares and you know, things that go bump in the night, that's, you know, it's, it, it's you know, it's, it's valid, but I, I think you, if you have, uh, or let's go back to the old universal classics. I, I mean, you know, these are monsters, vampires, Frankenstein, etc. mummy, you know, people die, you know, people, you know, um, but it's not like they wanted to do that, you know, vampires may be a little bit different as far as their sinister behavior, but um, you actually could understand, uh, Ed, not necessarily empathy all the time, but you have some sort of connection to, um, uh, to the uh, malevolent uh, character. Um, I find it more interesting. Uh, I like a psychological horror film uh, better. Um, um, if you're going to have uh, just special effects or things, you know, um, um, uh, you know explode, um, fragment, you know, limbs flailing, then you know, then go full zombie. <laughs> <laughs> you know. You know um, um, it's 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 more honest for that type of an, of an effect, but uh, again, you have to know you, you have to have a you have to have a story. Um, I haven't seen that many of the newer ones, to be quite honest. Uh, I, I, I've seen a lot of little indie shorts. There's a gentleman named uh, Jesse Burke who is an orthopedic surgeon out of Arkansas, and if you uh, go online, you could find one please cured. Uh, odd happenings in the tiny tent. Uh, those are all really great. Uh, you, can, you can say there's someone who are, uh, uh, but very, very talented. 
um, uh, all uh, uh, no dialogue. Um, I, I like, I'm a big fan of the independent film circuit, uh, but because of uh, contracts and uh, uh, copyrights, it's, it, it would be really a challenge. It would be, it's too difficult to put a compilation of, so I would, and, and to release it in the DVD, for instance. Uh, 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 I recommend, if you have a chance, once we get past the pandemic, uh, to go to, or even if it's online, uh, uh, indie filmmakers and you know, support them, and because that's where you'll find the freshest, newest ideas. Uh, and I, I've seen a lot of shorts that were in the horror genre that are just remarkable. I mean, right out of a, a you know a dreamscape. Uh, so I, I think it's um, I think the, the I think the genre and uh, the, the writing and creativity in the genre is strong as ever. It's nice to see uh, uh, how pe how people's perspective changed uh, over the, over the years. Um, you can have a, uh, you know weak and powerful uh, in, in in every era, so it it comes down to personal taste and also uh, how much homework did you do? Because if it's a film, you have your dialogue, you have your character development, you have your story arcs, and you have your theme. Then you also have your uh, people that dress your sets. Your your art director. I recommend. Uh, you have your script, you have your, your character descriptions, you know what you want. Um, well, then also do your storyboard. And a storyboard is basically, you know, it's, it, it's a frame, it's a, it's, a, it's a drawing. You can do it on a computer or you can draw it out. What are you going to see when you start the shot? You know, I look for things like I have a, I studied art history and uh, um, when I see a shot, like right now, I got a little bit of a window here. That's an interesting space, and then there's less there. And there's you know, so where you place your objects within the frame uh, have a lot to do with the tension, um, I mean, um, dynamics, uh, movement. Uh, I mean, there's a lot to it. There's a lot to it. Then you get into color, uh, shades, lighting. Like I, one of the things that surprised me most when I started out was understanding how why it takes so long to dress and set the lighting for us for a, for a scene and, and then i started looking through the camera when i did cuckoo's nest i asked milos uh, he let me look through the panavision camera and uh, one of the uh, dps handed me a book on cinematography and i started studying that and it and it, and it, it, it correlated with a lot of what I learned about art history and famous paintings and sculptures and stuff. So um, there's a lot of different levels uh, of different um, um, word, um, skill sets that, that, co that come together to make the whole package. And the last, of course, is your, is your music, you know, um, that, uh, your, uh, your soundtrack. Um, and, and, and a good ADR work, which is uh, additional dialogue and recording. Um, um, so it, it, the film is not just one star uh, doing their thing for their own ego. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's not a movie. You know, it might make money and pay bills, but you know, and if they're the writer, producer, director, and star, then what are you gonna do if they're mm -hmm. funding it? But, uh, but yes, I I I, I see the, uh, that there's been no um, decrease in creativity over the years. Uh, I'm still a fan. Yeah. What's your top five horror movies of all time? Uh, okay, uh, Exorcist, Evil Dead. The original werewolf. Mm, probably um, mm, that's a good question. I, I'm, I'm, I'm going through my library in my head. Um, oh. Uh, 
the killer shrews. Okay. And uh, probably um, Soyet Green. Mm -hmm. The exercise is the scariest, uh, though. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty scary. Yeah. (laughs) Were you able to see that in the theaters when it came out? Because I know your friend will in the Blair. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, 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 We're very good friends. Yeah. And uh, um, go to her website, and uh, she, she does uh, support her if you can uh, with uh, um, her uh, a- animal rescues. Yeah, she's a good kid. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you're also an environmentalist as well. I've read. Yes. Yeah. Um, there is a very famous uh, passage from I think it's Chief Joseph. I forget what uh, Native American tribe, but you know, mankind will die from uh, uh, loneliness. After you know, after we kill off all the wildlife, you know, uh, I I got to meet a gentleman who was working with uh, Jacques Cousteau's uh, people. I studied oceanography you know, through the um, Smithsonian Institute. There is uh, I used to get uh, uh, mailings. It's called Sea Secrets, Secrets of the Ocean, and um, um, they say all life evolved from the from the sea. I was a scuba diver and surfer for for decades. Um, you know, I mean, humans take take your garbage and whatnot and go dump it in the ocean like it's just going to go away. You know, nuclear waste, I mean, wrap it in cement and concrete and steel, uh, and you know, and it's dissolving. You know, it's still toxic forever. I never should have split the atom. Not a fan of. Uh, nuclear power at all. It's horrible, evil. I don't need it, never needed it, ever. Um, no purpose for it. Mm-hmm. There were alternatives. Um, I'm a big fan of, a uh, uh, big supporter of local local community gardens. Um, you know, see, I grew up through the, Cold War into the love and peace generation, and even today we still have parts of uh, society around the world that, you know, think they're all stupid. You know, anybody that loves the planet or they're tree hugging stupid fool. Well, we're not. I tell people, don't have children. Why should you bring someone into the planet if you're not going to try to make our, our home any better? There was a catalog called the whole earth catalog started way back in the 60s and on the front and back of the is a catalog before the internet anything and everything it was wonderful earth one side back earth the other part of the earth i always thought that the uh, first image of earth from the satellite would uh, cause an awakening to most people it should have I mean, you're seeing this this wonderful class nine planet with the blue orb, which is our home, it's our mother. I mean, if that doesn't humble you or make you respectful, there's something wrong with you. Yeah. You know. And you know, it, it's just it's it's just uh, small-hearted, uh, selfish thinking. Mm-hmm. Um, from those who, you know, have a, a grip on the control, you know, well, you don't, you don't impress me. You're going to die like anybody else. And I've, I've, I've met billionaires that were in that ilk, and they, you know, they would say something condescending. And I'd say, well, you know what? Um, you might want to try to be a better person because when you're in that nursing home and all your millions are going to go to your heirs and they're not visiting you because you are an ass and they don't care, you're going to be a, you know, scared little kid. Yeah. You might want to treat that nurse or a caregiver pretty well because when they change your dressings, you know, it might, owie, it might hurt. You know, you spend your whole life being, being a jerk like that. It's going to come back to haunt you. And I don't know when you, when I leave the room, when you laugh, you know, I want to see, you know, uh, you remember. Yeah, the day will come. Yeah. In the meantime, why be a jerk? You know what? You know there used to be bumper stickers that would say, "The one that dies with the most toys wins." Really? I mean, again, you know, 
you know, I mean, really, uh, I could go on and on and on. I, yeah. You know, but, uh, uh, you know, Dr. Strangelove, I mean, <laughs> you know, that's a, that's a horror movie. Yeah. <laughs> Old comedy. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, oh, and then uh, uh, on the list of famous horror movies, well, it's not really a horror movie, but it's a horrific movie. It's beautiful to watch. Um, Solian Green, of course, and the other one, of course, is uh, uh, Planet of the Apes. Yeah, with Charlton yeah. Heston. Yeah, with Heston. Yeah, at the very end. I mean, you can't beat somebody over a head for two hours and, and call that entertainment, but when you save your punch, you know, for the right moment, it, it, it stops them dead in their tracks and you have a chance to, uh, you know, be uh, kind of poignant. Yeah. Yeah, it's a word, poignant. I have a dictionary right behind me and it's, the, it, it, it's, it's that thick. I got, it, I got it at a thrift shop for the, uh, for the animal shelter in California before we left to come to Florida. And, uh, they wanted ten dollars for it. It's about a two hundred dollar book. I said, "I'll give you 20 <laughs> <laughs> It's wonderful, poignant. It's a good word. Look it up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And bringing up animal hunters before uh, a couple days ago, I, I was at a place and there was this guy just bragging about him hunting deer. He was like the rats. I just don't understand why people consider animals less than anything. I really don't. Well. Yeah, some people have that perspective. Um, I was a, I had a lot of different jobs, and one of them in college was I was a, I was a butcher. I worked in a cold environment, didn't get heat stroke. I had a lot of friends who were in the ag department at Cal Poly, which is, uh, I mean, people grow your food. So um, I've been to slaughterhouses just to know what it was like. Their eyes are as big as your head, and they're and they're they're terrified. They, it's it's a really bad day, you know, not a fun day mm-hmm. at all. And uh, I I hunted uh, twice. Uh, the first time I went, I, I decided not to take a shot. The second time I went out, I uh, my friend says, you know, heart long, they won't run away, and it drops. Them. I said, well, I used to be, you know, uh, I don't want to ruin a good rib. So I just waited till I had a shot. I did a, a brain shot, you know, blew his head off. You know, it wasn't a pretty picture, but every bit of that went to feed a family. You know, if you had yeah. to go out, if you had to go out and and uh, and and feed your family or your village or your tribe or whatever, uh, it's a lot of work. Um, you know, fishing is it, it, it's 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 not quite the same because they're not as warm and fuzzy as we are, but. Uh, they have a rough, rough time too. I figure if you're going to have to take a life, it should be quick and painless, as, as painless as possible. Mm. You know, so that, that's kind of my, my, um, yeah. So that's my philosophy on that. I, you know, I, 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 I eat chicken and uh, tuna and eggs and uh, occasionally ground beef. Yeah, but uh, um, you know, you can't do everything. Uh, you know hunky-dory, so to speak. I mean, when, when you have a, a large branch, I mean, that's it, it, That's how they do it. That's, I think that's why you're supposed to say grace before a meal. Yeah. You know, well, uh, I took it, uh, uh, someone took this, uh, this animal's life and it's going to give me nourishment. You know, mm-hmm. uh, it's, it's respect. Yes. You know? and, and when we start, start taking things for granted, um, our humanity starts to slip away. Mm-hmm. And, uh, Look where we are today. <laughs> Before COVID nineteen came upon us, unfortunately, did you have? Were you working on any films, any yes. pre production or in production? Yes, um, I had a whole stack of uh, scripts ready to go. I had uh, movies ready to go. I had conventions ready to go. I lost a year's worth of work overnight, and I haven't come back. Oh well, yeah, it devastated the. Our industry, many people in my industry and my union are losing their health insurance because we have to keep making so much new monies every year or you, you lose your health insurance. That's a reality. Yeah. Um, we've wasted uh, almost a whole year because uh, some creatures uh, don't seem to care. They have theirs. Uh, that's all I'm going to say on that. It's obvious. 
it's so obvious um, and it's just uh, mean and cruel and I, in my opinion it's just, uh, I consider it second degree murder yeah if you're not part of us uh, if, if you can make things better and you choose not to and uh, you cause harm and uh, harm and suffering uh, then uh, the blood, blood is on your hands you can spin it in any way you like, call me a liberal, whatever. And uh, I'm not a Democrat or a Republican. I'm a registered independent. So go, you know, you know go yeah. grow, grow the hell up. Yeah. Uh, I'm an independent as well. So I, I know what you're talking about. But yeah, I, I 100% agree. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of room for improvement. Uh, it's been getting long today. I, I want to just say, uh, number one, uh, you're. Uh, been a great interview. Uh, a lot of your questions and perspectives uh, um, uh, uh, were delightful to respond to. Thank you very much. Um, I think you're going to do fine with this. And uh, I'll just leave it with this. Um, um, there are two things that uh, I believe cause uh, most of the pain and suffering on the, in our lives. Number one, who do you pray to? It causes people to die. Number two, if I draw a line in the dirt, people die. Now, like I said earlier, when you see a picture of a planet, like planet Earth, I don't see the boundary lines. You see? Yeah. So uh, maybe there's something there to reflect on. Mm -hmm. So um, be lazy. For the following reason, it takes 14 muscles in your face to frown and get all worked up. It only takes three to smile. There you have it. There you have it. Right, brother, thank Michael you. Berryman, I want to thank you for coming on my show. It was a great honor. Uh, I'm right back at you. <laughs> I want you to take care and stay safe, all right? I will. You do the same. Thank you. You're very welcome. Yeah. Peace out. Peace out.